Director of Inpatient Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Acadia Hospital. In addition, he serves as the psychiatric team leader for the small but growing eating disorder program. Originally hailing from Dallas, Texas, he earned his undergraduate degree in neuroscience from Washington and Lee University, where he graduated cum laude. He completed medical school and his residency in adult psychiatry at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. Dr. Allen then completed a fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry at New York Presbyterian, the University Hospital of Columbia and Cornell. Dr. Allen's own life was touched by cancer as his mother is a breast cancer survivor of 19 years. It was from this experience that his initial interest in medicine grew. He is very happy to join you this morning to facilitate this important conversation. Strictly here in a, as a, in a supportive fashion, and I can answer all kinds of questions and just talk nonstop. Um, but this, you know, cancer uh, unfortunately touches all kinds of people uh, from all walks of life, and so I would prefer to sort of give most of the time for our patient panel over to these two gentlemen, and then at the end, uh, kind of go from there with where, whatever questions y'all may have. Um, I do have a background in eating disorder work. There is, you know, obviously a massive component with the recovery process as far as body image goes for anybody who's actually going through chemotherapy or, or radiation or whatever. Um, and I've, I've lived through it myself and my mom, uh, as well as many patients I've worked with. So um, happy to, to just talk. Um, so I'm gonna let, I guess, Alan, are you going first? Or? I think we voted me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just not willingly. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Good morning. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Robin, did you introduce us? Did we? No, um, no I, I didn't. <laughs> oh, so we'll introduce ourselves. All right, great. I was not I was zoned out there for a minute to talk to Dr. Allen, so um, I'll do a brief introduction, and uh, I'm one of two panels here to help represent a voice of, I guess, survivorship, right? Body image and survivorship, and we're just two voices of thousands in Maine, and, um, and I recognize that we're all male voices, and there's not a female voice at this for this panel, and I just want to put that out there so you know that I'm aware that we just represent a voice of survivorship, not of gendership. I think it's important to say today, um, especially given the comment earlier from Sandy about the role of partners in this journey. Uh, my name is Jonathan Henry. I go by John. John Henry. People think it's my first name. It's the whole name, Jonathan Henry. Um, I am a 10-year survivor. Halloween Day, 2007, was my surgery, so I just celebrated a 10-year cancerversary. Uh, I wish I would say it was cancer-free. It wasn't, and it's not. I had a recurrence nine years into this journey, and last winter, uh, my PSA started going up. I'm a prostate cancer survivor, and it went up, and up, and up, and finally had to make a decision and went through radiation and hormone therapy at Lafayette Family Cancer Center. From January 27th, not that I'm counting, through July 11th when my Lupron shot expired and my testosterone levels started to come back to normal. Women, you deserve medals for menopause. <laughs> because that was the worst, that made radiation look like a picnic. The, uh, the hormone therapy, the chemical castration, as is affectionately called, was far worse. It was worse than the actual surgery, I think, because of what it does to you psychologically and physically in terms of your body image and your emotional image and who you are. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it's been a 10 year journey and it's one that, I don't have type notes, I'm sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm winging this this morning, I usually am more, more prepared and have written notes, but this is a journey of the heart and the mind and the soul for all of us, so I'm, I'm just going with what I think about body image. Um, 
Cancer wreaks havoc on all of you. I think Jenny talked a little bit about that. I was late for her remarks because you, you feel, in my case, I was 44. I'm probably one of the younger people in the room, I'm guessing, in terms of diagnosis. And that's always been an, uh, a dubious distinction when I'm, on, I'm literally on a poster in the Lafayette Family Cancer Center as a person who, has, you know, who said, even while you're a, you are a vulnerable and scared, you become alive and joyful. Even while you are vulnerable and scared, you become alive and joyful. And that is completely true, I think, because you begin to wonder, why me? Why does this happen? Um, what did I do to my body to create the conditions of cancer? Did I have a role in that? Is it nature versus nurture? And then the journey begins. And then you start to, to wonder what will happen as you make those treatment decisions that Jenny referenced, and what will happen as a result of that. Um, all in my case, while raising children, having a job, trying to sustain a marriage, be involved in the cancer community with Ollie and uh, Ollie and Sandy, uh, Sandra, and um, it's just a crazy thing you nobody expects to go through. But then once you're in that road, it's like you've gotten on that bus. You you really don't have a choice, do you? You know, everyone have you ever heard that phrase? Welcome to the club that you never want to be a member of. <laughs> it's kind of a, a cliche, but it's totally true, isn't it? Um, but the body image question, I think I want to use my last few minutes talking about what it meant for me. Early on, especially after surgery, I lost weight for surgery. My, my weight was about 220 pounds forever. I got down by 210 for surgery on Halloween day. Um, I'll just keep referencing that because the anesthesiologist was dressed as a bumblebee. <laughs> <laughs> Images you never forget. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, do me two things. Keep me asleep when I'm supposed to be asleep and wake me up when I'm supposed to be awake. Uh, that was an anxiety I had. Um, where was I going? So I tried to get in better shape for surgery and went through it and made it through surgery and have had side effects. Um, the side effects that men often get. There, it's erectile dysfunction and urinary issues for men. You're likely to get one or the other or both depending on your age. And so the to cut the story very short, during the next 10 years, those, one of those has been a, a real struggle for me and in my life. And I was pretty crappy and miserable and grumpy. As my wife said, we're just excellent roommates, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> that stung, that stung, and that was two years ago because she was right, you know, I had shut down. My body image was extremely weak. Uh, despite my career, despite being a great dad, a school board member, building a new high school in town, being involved in my church, president of my congregation, all the public faces, but the internal was grief and distress, and dysmorphic sense of self, and lack of a sense of se sexual self. So it was pretty crappy. And then the recurrence happened. The numbers started going up. I went to Dana-Farber, and they said, oh yeah, you're gonna have a recurrence. It's a not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I'll never forget Dr. Mary Ellen Taplin's words. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Well then, I loved to prove her wrong, because she said that in 2015, and in 2016 my numbers went down. <laughs> The specialist of genital urinary cancer in New England was wrong. No, she wasn't. Because uh, after six months after my son's wedding in the summer of 15, my numbers went up and then they went up again. So then I woke up and the body image became not just one of a psychological sense, but I want to fight this. This cancer's bad. I have to make a clinical decision. And so I started going on a fitness journey. I said, how will I ever know I can take better physical care of myself first to fight the recurrence and the trajectory, the velocity of it, without uh, I just have to know I can try that first. So I had put on some weight in those 10 years out of that grief, you know? I got up to 235 pounds. And I'm very public with my numbers because I think you have to have a sense of what this means. And so I started on my journey and uh, joined a gym. Uh, what else did I do? I did a lot of things that fall. I went to a men's retreat, namely men it was called. It's been around for 35 years. Some of you may have heard about it. It's in Gardner, Maine. Awesome. Best thing I ever did other than getting married and having kids. Um, it was amazing, it was transformative to find adult male friends, some of whom have had cancer journeys, many who have had not, but who accept you for who you are as an adult male trying to sort out your life post kids being raised. By the way, Jenny's a neighbor, her kids and my kids are in high school, so we are simpatico, we get it. So a confluence, as my wife called it, a confluence of things occurred a year ago this month that changed my life, it was transformed. And in the last year I've lost 52 pounds and changed who I am as a person in many, many ways. Got a new job, too, twice, which is not really, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, and I'm not using that number again just out of boastfulness. That's not my point. My point is that the cancer reference woke me up. My body image was important to me because I felt broken by that disease. I was angry. I'm still angry at God. I say that publicly as a preacher's kid. As a man who was president of my congregation, I'm still angry at trying to figure out why me, why us, 
Why anybody? And you know what my pastor said when I had a beer with him? Yeah, his pastor drinks beer. He said, he said well, you have cancer, but if not you, then who should get it? If not you, who should get it? Yeah. Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> but by turning myself around physically, I actually slowed down the trajectory. My last numbers were slower. Uh, so when I actually went through radiation, it, it, it got better. And my, re my recovery rate was better from radiation. I still have the hot flashes, I still show up in my t-shirt, and my wife and I both threw the covers up, we went through all the hot flashes together. <laughs> and we kept a sense of humor about it. But she saw the transformation in me and ended up having to fill in for our pastor at church and do a sermon, and her sermon was called Confluence. It was about the road to a maze, for those who know the scripture. Um, it was the same Sunday, and I was marveling at her, or the importance of her in my journey as a caregiver and a co-survivor in this process, to understand why I was doing what I did. It also frightens the heck out of her, because I weigh almost what we weighed when we got married 30 years ago. Um, but I, I recognized that I had to be in control of my sense of self and image, and I had not yet done that. Um, I had only dealt with the grief and sort of mired in the darkness. Has anyone you know what it, it's mired in the darkness? It was like I was there and I was sort of lo not loving it, but there was something that was drawing me to it. And I saw what it was doing destructively. And now I have a better image, but I also have the private grief. I have a truck, Toyota Tacoma. That was my dream truck. I also bought that for the occurrence. I, I don't have any days I've got left. I'm not going to call Gigi, but what's, what's the grandfather? <laughs> but that's my safe space. And so when you have those moments of joy and celebration and recovery and recurrence, and you feel better about who you are, you still have the private grief. You still have the loss. In fact, I wrote on Facebook during my 10-year uh, my anniversary in the Prostate Cancer Support Group that every damn day I wrote, I still think about it. I still grieve the, what cancer has done to my physical self. But I also celebrate that I have a community here in this region, online and in my family and with the fellow survivors that will help you sort of slap you aside the head once in a while and wake up and say, but you're here. Nelson Levitt, a wonderful man I met 10 years ago, who was the first person to call me from the Augusta region and said, you know, every day's a good day if you're on this side of the dirt. And kind of, Blunt, but, but made a lot of sense. Um, and since then, you have there's a lot of phrases that we use, but I really do believe that, that there are so many things to be grateful for. And even in the midst of the darkest days, and there have been many dark days, back to the truck, my truck is my crying place when I have the grief. And I can almost well up right now. The truck is my place. I can drive alone, I can put on whatever music I want, and I, I can just cry out the head I want. When I come, my wife doesn't have to see me crying again. Especially since my testosterone is back. I cry less. <laughs> um, the body image is our theme today uh, because whatever kind of disease we are fighting, it impacts us in some way, some fashion. And I know Jenny's story. She and I share a lot because she literally lives down the street from me. Um, and one gift I think I believe in is the notion of paying it forward. And in my involvement with the prostate cancer community, Locally, we had our Men's Cancer Network last night, Robin, and we had one of the most productive conversations we've had in a long, well, since the group restarted last spring. The men were wide open and really engaged, is that by engaging in your own healing process and sharing with others in appropriate ways, you can help not only heal yourself, but be that network, that social fabric of this cancer community that we are for each other. And that came through last night, and I slept very well knowing that those men felt that sense of connectedness and that we can look down this road together trying to figure out how to move forward. Um, I don't want to say fighting this season, I don't like the word fight, but managing, managing this illness, both physically and psychologically. So that's completely top of mind, um, but it's from the heart. I wear my emotions on my sleeves, which is why I wear long sleeves, because they're wet from tears. Uh, and I'm not afraid to cry about my journey, uh, but I'm also not afraid to smile and say that we are doing this and we each take it our own way and use the people around us to try to make it one day better at a time. Well, thank you for a few minutes just to share my story with you and um, I would love to hear yours throughout the rest of the day. I'm gonna turn it over to Alan. Who was timing me? I hope that was less than 12 minutes. Perfect. Okay, good. Well, actually, while, while you're still up, uh, well, right. yeah, and, it's, and it, as he was saying, it's pretty fresh. Is there anybody that wants to like to have any questions for John? <laughs> Did I scare you that much? Yeah. Uh, is, uh, I have read 
somewhere that there's a relationship between prostate cancer and breast cancer. And I wonder if, uh, if you are having your children do any genetic testing or? That is a great question. The question was, is there a connection between <coughs> prostate cancer and breast cancer? Or what do we know genetically speaking? Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, I don't know. I know there is some connection. Dr. Beauregard did do a presentation years ago about the likelihood of a, of a child almost either getting has a higher likelihood of getting one of those diseases if a parent has one. I don't know the specifics, but there is an elevated risk, particularly for prostate cancer. My sons have a higher risk, significantly, because I was diagnosed at a young age, it was even higher. So as part of my recurrence, they recommended Dana-Farber's uh, telemedicine genetics counseling, which I did do. And I met with a genetic counselor for, it seems like forever, two hours on a video conference, and they took my blood and sent it away to some fancy place in California because they just discovered, this is the recent medicine, like Herceptin, six months ago, a gene related to prostate cancer called the HOXB13, I think it's called, don't quote me on it, HOXB, that is directly related. So they were gonna test me for that mutation, and they did, and of course, here on pins and needles, the results came back, I did not have the mutation, which therefore means my sons don't have to get tracked at the age of 30, they can wait until, well, they say 50, no, they're going to 40. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to 40, I'll pay for the test. Um, so there is a connection, and uh, I have two brothers uh, now who are older but are tracked more carefully because I had it. My father probably did, but he died of a stroke, and so we'll never know. But based on what mom used to say about him going to the bathroom in the middle of the night all the time, I suspect there may have been something going on with his prostate. I don't know, but there is a, there is a connection. Uh, genetic testing is available, but it's questionable. Should, what, what if I did have the mutation? What do I tell my sons? Do I tell them? They were, they're already freaking out. My younger son, particularly like Jenny's younger daughter, really struggled with this. Because um, another part of my story for another day is that I had another medical incident eight months after my first cancer. I had a brain injury that was far worse and almost took my life. And it was general. And so my younger son was greatly affected by that. That's why I don't postpone joy. Never postpone joy. That's another thing for the takeaway for today. So genetic testing, I, I think is good, but you have to go in with your eyes wide open about what it means if you find something out you might not want to know. Yes, ma'am. Don't I always have a question, Dr. Always, yeah, ever. <laughs> you know, it struck me again. You are 10 years out, Obi and I are 12 years out. And the story we hear again and again is what you related to, what happened to you emotionally. Even so, you had support. And we know, I mean, Jenny spoke to it, there's such remarkable progress in how you treat and how you identify and personalizing it. What about the need to take care of your emotional state, your family state? Do we know, or does anybody know, is there any progress in recognizing that we need to treat the whole person, that what we each feel can be devastating and we don't know how to emerge from it? How much time do we have? <laughs> so I'll give the short answer. Sure, sure. My, my horoscope this morning said something about being brief rather than long-winded. So I'll be hurry. I think there's formal and informal. The formal emotional, I think, is, is the support groups. It's the networks that are available out there, like statewide. Uh, in our local cancer center, the Lafayette Family Cancer Center, the prostate cancer group was declining. It actually, they ran out of steam. I was coordinating, and so there was no formal mechanism. Even the women had the same opportunity in the discharge notes in the hospital about resources. There's nothing for men. Huh. Double standard, in my opinion. Yeah. So we got a new home and caring connections. Thank you, Robin. They got a grant. They picked it up, and we now have a great network. So there's the formal structures, but most people will find an informal structure that works for them. It could be family. It could be friends. It could be these groups, which start as formal support groups, but mel or morph into friendships. Uh, uh, fellow survivors. Uh, there are a few men in this group that I have connected with, and we have great discussions about the uh, side effects of cancer over martinis, and I find that very effective. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't happen often, but, over, but, uh, but those kind of things, and I think you have to find what works for you. In my case, my wife has uh, co-survivor fatigue. She's kind of tired of hearing about it. She'll never say that. She did once. But most, the time, but most of the time, I can tell. So I was really wanting to seek friendships, and, and that has helped a lot, both survivors, but also non-survivors who are just buddies, who have, one's a diabetic, one has a terrible marriage, one is fighting a, uh, an addiction. We all have our demons, if you will, and that has been my network, that this isn't the only thing. We have cancer is one thing we face. But I think emotionally, you have to accept a couple things. It's not all roses. 
there are the dark days. It's it's like life. It's cyclical. You have and, and embrace it. I, you know, you, you embrace the darkness, you'll know that there's light out there, and I, I believe that. Um, and I think medical centers are getting better and better at complementary medicine and providing the resources. I think they're waking up and drinking the coffee now. <laughs> Finally, but we as patients have to advocate for that. Otherwise, they become overtly clinical. You need to have the other pieces to it, uh, navigators, social workers, etc. So that's the somewhat short answer, in my opinion. <coughs> I'm gonna cut me off. Good. No, no, no. Well, <laughs> that and also to that a couple of what you were saying. I mean, you can't treat cancer in a bubble. I mean, you, when you the person who suffered from cancer, you, they go home to their family, and, and that's still a shared experience. I mean, it, it, getting family involvement is vital. I remember when my mom was diagnosed. And my dad and I. We, would have been amazing had we actually had some kind of family support group to go to. Instead, I just marched off and I decided to kind of internalize it or sublimate, go into medicine with a focus on mental health to make sure that people in, I thought I was gonna go to pediatric oncology, but then just doing pediatric mental health for folks who had cancer. So anyway, um, it, it, I think it's, it's, it is a really, really, really important thing um, and I, I think most hospitals should have it, but as, as you were alluding to, it sounds like resources are growing, uh, but there's a lot, a lot of work to be done. Yeah, what, what postscript than that, I should have mentioned this, my younger son's a social worker in Portland, he works with disenfranchised, displaced teens, but he's a volunteer for Barbara Bush's Center for Greater Children. He does this on his own, which is impressive, and um, he started getting to the training a few months ago, he said, Dad, did you know we could have had those resources? I could have had resources for these students whose parents have had an illness. And he said it with such an affirmation, it's like, Ah, he was in eighth grade. He was struggling all this time. And he now is aware as a graduate from college that he needed that. He needed and wanted that resource. And we didn't know about it. It wasn't available. I was the one who was seeking counseling and therapy, but not the others in my family. I, was, I wasn't blind to it, but boy, do I wish I had known because now they're dealing with this as adults and this anxiety about that. So it never involving the family, and I think involving the partners in the breast cancer journey, I think is a great suggestion as well. I'm mindful of the time. I want to be sure Alan has plenty of time for his story. So um, I'm sure we'll have time for questions after it, I hope. Thank you all. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Alan Lobbish. Before I get started, I just want to let you know that I'm, I'm no stranger to public speaking. I've been a trainer on the national stage for over 20 years. Now, nothing makes me more nervous than being up here today because of the emotion that telling this story gives. So bear with me. Um, I brought my box of tissues. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think the way I'm going to go, and I'm, you know, what I did is I went with a full, I, I wanted to make sure I stayed on task. I didn't go too far. I didn't go, there's so many directions that I could go with my story. Um, I wanted to make sure I kind of stuck with it and didn't go on forever and didn't miss the important messages that I really wanted to be able to share with you today. So, um, so I'm the former executive director of the MDI YMCA. I got married in June 2015 to my beautiful wife, Amanda, over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, right, right here in Bar Harbor, actually right over here at COA, right on the water, it was, it was magical. Um, we celebrated our honeymoon in Australia in September of 2015. A month after we returned home from Australia, I'll never forget that day, November 4th, 2015, I was diagnosed with nasal pharyngeal cancer. I had a two inch by one inch tumor behind my nose that it grew back into my eustachia tube uh, and it spread to three lymph nodes in my neck. Within two weeks, I visited both Dana Farber uh, in Boston and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City and to learn that I had late stage, late stage three or four cancer. Um, I decided to go to Memorial Sloan Kettering as I had family and friends in the New York and Connecticut area. I was fortunate enough to be accepted into the American Cancer Society's Hope Lodge on 32nd Street in Manhattan. Um, they not only provided myself and my father, who was my caregiver, with free lodging, uh, but they also gave transportation to the hospital every day. Um, this was huge as my treatment consisted of five days a week for seven weeks radiation directly to my face. It's a nightmare. Um, and one full day of chemo uh, for, for the seven weeks. Uh, that was followed by three more months of uh, adjuvant chemo, once a month uh, for four days at a time uh, in late February, March, and April of 2016. My support system was huge. It consisted of my family, my friends, 
Um, Rotary, who's a sponsor of today, who provided me with, with huge monetary support. The YMCA, our community, um, the staff at the Hope Lodge and at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, the meal trains from our community, the GoFundMe campaign, as I had no short-term disability or vacation time left as we just got home from uh, a one-month vacation to Australia. Um, I also have to throw a big thank you, and Stephen couldn't be here this morning. Many, many of you remember, uh, remember Stephen DeMuro from last year. He talked about his one awesome necklace, which I'm wearing here now. Um, he's sick. He got his chemo yesterday, and he's not doing well. He wanted to be here. But I want to throw out to him because I truly believe um, that this necklace um, and its mantra, which I will share at the end, um, helped save my life and has actually saved many others' uh, lives who we've shared um, with. But that's a, like a whole other story for a minute. <laughs> So during my seven weeks of treatment in New York City, I faced severe fatigue, nausea, extreme dry mouth, loss of taste, loss of appetite, and of course pain like I'd never experienced before. I lost my hair in several places, I had burns on my face, uh, and I've begun to lose weight and become a shell of my once healthy, full-figured self. Um, <laughs> and it was weird because, um, I'm going to go off script for just a second, um, I was healthy going into it. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, and, and, and um, Amanda's uh, cousin, who's an oncology nurse, you know, really summed it up for me. And she said, uh, you know, Alan, in order to, to kill the cancer, we kind of have to almost kill you. We're going to bring you both to the edge, push the cancer off, and keep you from falling. Mm -hmm. And that was really accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure I don't have to tell uh, all of you survivors it was hell. Um, uh, also, my, my wife had to stay here in Maine as she had to continue working as her employer was providing our health insurance. We needed the income and she also had no vacation time left. Fortunately, my parents-in-law, who were retired, drove up from Texas to stay with her during this time. We all met up in New Hampshire every weekend. Um, I'm not sure how many tens of thousands of miles, if not hundreds of thousands, by my family uh, were put on our vehicles that year. I know I myself on my taxes claimed over 10,000 miles in trips from Bar Harbor to Sloan Kettering during this wow. whole experience. Mm -hmm. And um, as a side note, my wife Amanda announced on Christmas Eve 2015 that she was pregnant. <laughs> we had conceived our first and only child, Eve, the morning I moved into the Hope Lodge. <laughs> the day before I started my treatment, Eve is 14 months old today. Um, <laughs> And let me know if you want to see pictures later. She's gorgeous. <laughs> anyway, after my seven weeks was over, um, my type A personality was like, hey, when can I go back to work? My doctors looked at me strangely, and they were like, you need six to nine months to recuperate. Um, you know, even, even you know, to return in any kind of full-time capacity. Um, and I should have known better than that, but my insides were going, come on, let's get back to work. It's time to go. Um, and I'd already been out of work for two months. Uh, and as the executive director of the Y, you can't leave an organization without a leader for a, a year, and that's if I survive this. Um, so after much contemplation with my family, we decided it was best for me to decrease my personal stress levels, um, and for the Y, as they deserved a full-time leader, so I resigned. Fortunately, the Y had long-term disability. What a savior. Mm -hmm. I returned home at this point to begin my re rehabilitation and traveled to New York City monthly for my adjuvant chemos in February, March, and April, so the hell continued. These treatments were as bad or worse than the seven weeks in New York City. But at least the radiation was over. The mouth sores were the worst. It was like I had bitten onto a hot muffler of a car. Um, my last chemo treatment was April 2016. By June 2016, I slowly began to feel better. I decided I was going to hike all of Acadia National Park as my rehab, and I did. I started with Wonderland and Ship Harbor. And I worked my way up to hiking to the peak of Cadillac Mountain from Blackwoods Campground all the way to Bar Harbor. This was the best spirit, mind, and body rehabilitation I could think of. It was not easy at first, but it actually slowly became an addiction. I kept a map on my wall and traced all the trails as I completed them. In October 2016, during one of my follow-up visits to Memorial Sloan Kettering, I was informed that my PET scan and my MRI were completely clear. I was officially cancer-free. I couldn't believe it. I was by myself for this visit. It was just a routine visit. I cried tears of joy for 20 minutes. I cried like I've never cried before. <laughs> I was not expecting this news, and especially not so soon. I still continue my visits every three months for scans and follow-ups, which are still clear. In January 2017, earlier this year, I began to return to work full-time as a safety and risk management consultant with SafeWise Consulting. 
and by next year I'll be working full time again. Today I continue to live with chronic dry mouth, uh, moderate fatigue, mild neuropathy, and pretty extreme hearing loss in both my ears, um, caused by both the cancer, which grew in my eustachian tube, and the chemo, which I'm sure you know, this is flat and flat in my hearing, uh, the ringing in my ears, it's like an air raid siren going off all the time. Um, I'm currently fighting the insurance companies to cover the hearing aids for the hearing loss, which is most frustrating from a social and a work perspective. I'm sure many of you can understand that. Um, but hey, you know what? I'm still here. <laughs> That's what matters. And it's amazing how resilient we can be as human beings, what we can get used to, um, and how we can move forward and how we can survive. So just a few takeaways and learnings I wanted to share with you. Um, and I'm sure most of you know this, but I still feel like I, I want to share this, is accept help. Um, people are going to offer help, say yes. Uh, I couldn't have done it without my team and without the support of everybody. People want to help, let them. We all need it. It fulfills a human need in all of us to help our fellow community members. Compliance. Do everything the doctors tell you. For me, that included taking my meds all the time, every time. Set alarms. It's like four or five times a day, you know. Um, eating when I really didn't want to, even when it hurt. And it hurt. Food was medicine. It had to be taken. Um, nasal irrigation. Twice a day. During treatment and for the rest of my life. Brushing my teeth after every time I eat. During treatment for the rest of my life. Numerous jaw exercises several times a day. During treatment for the rest of my life so my jaw doesn't seize up and I can continue eating burgers. <laughs> um, and then finally, as you all know, healthy eating, no smoking, and regular exercise. Stay positive. A positive attitude is everything. This is scientifically proven. Try and smile, laugh, tell jokes as much as possible. Believe me, I know it's hard. I definitely was not successful all the time. Trust me, my family shared with me after everything was over that I was not successful at being positive <laughs> or pleasant <laughs> all the time. Um, but I tried, and that's what counts. Um, if you're interested in talking more about the power of positivity, I've actually got some books and I've read some science one. It's pretty amazing. Actually, one little quick story that I, I like to tell is uh, when we were going through all the visits in New York City and we were going through different doctors and at every doctor I had to fill out a new form and you'd think Sloan Kettering would be able to have one form and everyone would get it, right? No. <laughs> so it said, you know, what's your name? And uh, then it said, what do you want to be called? So I put Supreme Commander of the Universe. <laughs> <laughs> so the nurse comes in and is the Supreme Commander of the Universe in here? And we had a good laugh, and it's an ongoing joke to till this day. And um, every time I go in there and I see my doctors, and they say, "How are you doing?" and I say, "Awesome," and they say, "Thank you," because we don't we don't always hear that, and we love to hear it. And it's uh, you know, there's so many things I could complain about, but I'm here, I'm alive, I'm fighting, you know. So, and then my last little piece, finally, um, is fight, fight, fight. Believe you will win. Never for a second think you will lose this battle. And please pardon my French, but as my one awesome necklace says, fuck cancer, I'm awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I made it without crying, I'm impressed. <laughs> If you have any questions, or I know it was body image, and I, I don't, I know it's actually kind of one of the interesting things for me is that uh, a lot of people, and people who knew me before were like, wow, Alan, you, you, you look great. And I'm like, yeah, cancer diet, don't try it. <laughs> uh, I lost a lot of weight. I lost about 50 pounds um, during the whole, I dropped under 200 pounds, and I was a good 245 uh, when going into it. Actually, my doctors were, were nice enough to tell me to, uh, they said, Alan, eat everything you love. You're never going to taste food the same way again. Um, so I pigged out in November, put on like 10 pounds. Best thing that they told me because I just dropped, 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 dropped. Um, and uh, I was really happy that they told me that because you know, it hasn't quite been the same. I got most of it back. But um, I look, when people look at me and they meet me, they don't realize the internal struggles that I'm going through. They don't realize the, the emotions uh, that go through the... The, you know, is it going to come back and you be as positive as you want to be? But that's a, it's always nagging a little bit in there. You're like, shh, stop it. You know, 
Um, the dry mouth, the hearing is devastating. Um, it's really challenging. I can't wait. I, I really hope I get these hearing aids. My wife promised me the other day. She said, even if the insurance companies don't pay, we're gonna we're gonna get you hearing aids um, because it's 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 uh, it makes social gatherings, it makes events like this super super challenging. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. If you have any, you know, if you have any questions or anything, I can answer for you. Wow. All right, I'll have a seat, and we can go from there. You're waiting for the microphone. There must be one question. <laughs> who actually is uh, on the planning committee of the Washington County Cancer Conference, and as uh, she was our plan. This was <laughs> I was wondering where you got the necklace. <laughs> well, that's the whole. <laughs> so, um, so I was ironically, I I saw the necklace um, before I ever had the diagnosis. We had the Live Strong program at the YMCA. And I was the executive director, and I had seen this necklace sitting on my wellness director, Becky's desk. Um, and for some reason, you know, it, it really um, it spoke to me even then. But when I got the diagnosis, I went to Becky, and much of the first thing I said to her was, I'm going to need one of those necklaces. And uh, it ended up that the necklace, ironically, initially, was uh, created by Stephen's ex-girlfriend, who's an artist, and it's a it's a silver spoon that's had the neck cut off, pounded out, and each letter is individually tapped into it by this artist. Um, so there was a whole process where Stephen showed up at my office one day. We'd never met before. It's the first time we met, and we talked for two hours. Instantly became brothers. He wanted to meet the person who may or may not get this necklace, and um, he called up Liz and. The day before I left for New York City, it showed up in my mailbox. Um, and that was actually grown into a huge thing. Um, he started a website. Um, I actually sent my original one. This is not my original. My original, that what, it was like the same, almost the same week that I got my one of my cancer-free diagnoses that my godmother got breast cancer. So I immediately sent her mine. She survived cancer and now has given it to someone else. Um, and I order, I actually keep a couple on hand because I go to New York City uh, for Christmas now to go to the Hope Lodge to, uh, I like to tell my story of hope and survival. Um, and I usually try to find someone, um, it happens very naturally, uh, who, who needs it. And last year I was there and I was a young girl, she was two weeks in and she had her mask on and her, lost her hair and we just sat there and I put it in her hand and I said, when you kick cancer's ass, you're gonna, you're gonna give this to the next person who needs it. So it's pretty wicked, it's pretty amazing what's happening with the, with the, this awesome necklace. Um, and I believe it's uh, www.oan1awesomenecklace.org. Uh, and the funds that are being raised for it are, are getting turned back towards um, people who are struggling financially. Um, so it's pretty, I really wish Stephen could have been here today, he really wanted to be here. Um, because uh, it's pretty, it's pretty epic as far as I'm concerned, and it's huge. This mantra, I believe, saved my life. Mm -hmm. I brought the mic. I just have one quick question. What was your um, symptom that drove you to to the doctor for this diagnosis? It's, a, it's it, that is actually it's it's an interesting story, um, but not unique. Um, one of the things before I tell you that, that I, when I was with the 60 other patients at the Hope Lodge in New York City, 90% um, of them had all been misdiagnosed. And I'm sure that it's an experience many of you in the, many of this in this room has had. So uh, a year and a half before my diagnosis, I was sitting on the couch with my father-in-law and my left ear closed up. And I was like, oh, allergies, a cold, you know, something like that. Well. Didn't go away, didn't go away, didn't go away. So I see my doctor, I'm getting ear drops, I'm getting nose drops, continue. And my doctor says, you know what, go see an ENT. So I go see an ENT, yeah. I see the ENT, he basically does the same thing. We go three months, he's putting, giving me ear drops, nose drops, blah, blah, blah. And um, he eventually goes, well, you're gonna have to get a tube um, because uh, I couldn't even drive through the mountains or go on an airplane because I couldn't clear, I couldn't clear the pressure. So he puts the tube in my ear, treating my symptoms, of course. Um, 
And this goes on, and actually it was the trip to Australia that um, the, 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 I guess some wax got caught in the tube and the air pressure on the airplane popped it out. So I went to the ENT and I had been talking with a few other people as well who kind of had questioned, you know, what's, what, why doesn't this go away? You know, what, why is this a year and a half now you're dealing with this? We just keep, we're treating the symptoms, we just keep putting tubes in. So I said to my ENT, I said, um, you know, why don't we do a further test? It was four days before my diagnosis, I actually said to him, what if I have cancer? And, uh, and I said, if you don't do more tests, I'm going to go to another doctor. The king, dude, I, I want to get checked. And he goes, well, let me, let me do this one thing. And right there in his office was a, uh, a, um, a camera that they put down your nose. It's a scope. So he scopes me, and it's a moment I'll never forget my whole life. He goes, oh, I don't want to hear your doctor say that. I said, what? He goes, we need to take a biopsy. And that was, oh. And then, you know, that was probably just, that was the first worst thing I ever heard, followed by the C word, you know, you have cancer. So uh, he biops, he biops me, I drive home, I'm crying all the way home, um, calling my wife, calling my mom, I, I, I can't, and everyone's, of course, what are they saying? Relax, Alan, you come on, you don't have cancer, no one in my family, no one on either side of my family's ever had cancer. I'm the first one, lucky me. Um, <laughs> and... Um, yeah, lo and behold, we go in four days later and we, we go into the office and I kind of knew because uh, I looked at, I saw him walking behind the desk and I could see this look on his face, complete horror that he had to sit here and tell me this. I um, go in his office and he says, uh, you have cancer. And then he had to ask Amanda to leave the room because he had to put a tube in my ear. And what was interesting is he said to me, um, he goes, can I ask you a question? Whatever, yeah, sure. Uh, and he goes, how did you know you had cancer? I got a bit angry and I said some choice words. And I said, you know what? It doesn't take a doctor to realize that you've been treating my symptoms. And in a year and a half, you've, that scope has been sitting there in this office. I've come to you every three months for a year and a half. And, and, and that's what the doctors at both Dana Farber and Merle Sloan Kettering, they all very much would go, he just scoped you. I got scoped every visit, everywhere I went, all the time. I still get scoped every time I go down. So it was my, uh, my two cents to people is be your own advocate. Absolutely. Push. We, we unfortunately, and I'm sorry for the medical professionals in the room, but I feel like we have a system that is really set up to treat symptoms. And you get put through the, 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 the just, you know, mm -hmm. get you in, get you out, get you in, get you out. No. Push. Mm -hmm. Push. I should have pushed sooner, and I will always push again. And I said, do, you know, do not let them just treat your symptoms. It's like 90% of the people I've spoken to with a cancer diagnosis have some form of the same story of misdiagnosis for X amount of time, and then, oh my gosh. And the crazy thing was, is that I had been getting my yearly checkups. It was a few months beforehand. I had a full blood work, the whole lot, and I said, check everything. I want to make sure I'm healthy. I'm trying to do all the right things. Alan, you're 100% clear. Everything is good. Nothing picked up except that Eustachia tube. That was the one thing that picked it up. And I said to my doctors, what would happen if we didn't find it? And because it had spread, it, so it had gone from the nose to the Eustachia tube into the three lymph nodes. He said, I don't know how much longer it would have been, but it would have gone into your vital organs and it would have been over. So, uh, and like I said, it was like stage three, stage four when we found it. Wow. So it's, it's crazy, it's crazy. Thank you. I have a quick question. Did you, prior to your diagnosis, did you use your cell phone a tremendous number of times? Who doesn't? <laughs> I um, ask that because my son did, and at 42, he had a tumor in his ear canal. Interesting. He they, does not use his cell phone, and it is, he has a mic on his neck. On his oh, interesting. The, the, um, my cancer was super, super rare. Um, it, it's actually, it's only common in about, in two regions of China and amongst uh, native people, which is, uh, you know, I'm not from China and I'm, I'm pretty Caucasian. Um, and uh, it, it, I forgot where I was going with that, I'm sorry. Epstein-Barr um, virus. Oh, thank you. Um, they related it to the Epstein-Barr virus, high levels of the Epstein-Barr virus, which all, it's mono, which ironically I've never been diagnosed with mono. Um, but they related it to that people who get this um, have uh, high levels of Epstein-Barr. And if any of you guys knew David Bridges, 
um, who, who passed recently. David had the same cancer as me. Um, and there's another gentleman from Lemoyne right now um, who I, I shouldn't, I won't mention his name, but he's also fighting the same cancer, which is interesting. And uh, it's funny how life goes. I was having a transfer switch installed on my house a couple weeks ago. I talked to the electrician. I told him my story. He went, oh my God, he goes, my friend has the same cancer as you. So I've, I've kind of become a support system for him. We talked for hours. He's, he's halfway through his treatment in Boston right now. Um, it's only 45 and he's just, you know, it's, it's kind of strange. It's really odd because it's super, 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 it's like one in a hundred thousand cancer patients has this cancer. So actually at Sloan Kettering, there was only, they only treat two to three patients a month with this cancer, which you figure Sloan Kettering is like, you, I, I don't know if any of you guys have been down there. It's a, it's a machine. It's a machine I've never seen. It's, it's really amazing. So. Thank you. Are you and Alan? You're going to be here during the day. And John, yep. you'll be here. So you can walk up to them and uh, say whatever you want. I mean, to Mark, uh, ask some questions. And uh, thank you all for participating. You, you I just want to say one shout out because you work for the Y and you said Livestrong, and I should have mentioned that my weight loss is attributed to the Livestrong program. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. I was part of it at the Bangor Y. That's how I met Robin. She met me when I was much heavier. And when we did a focus group about the Livestrong program, and we got it. And then Adam Clark, the trainer whose nickname for me is Sally. I don't love him for that. <laughs> <laughs> but he motivates me. So Livestrong's a great program, so is the Y. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you.